in Rome 2023. I can see myself knowing that I'm the captain leading the European side. I'm excited to be here in 2023. I cannot wait. The countdown begins now, really. So many of my greatest memories and experiences have been through Ryder Cups. You're not playing for money, but you're playing for pride, you're playing for your country, your flag, your teammates, for the history of the sport. You're playing for more than just yourself. And um, to obviously have the privilege and honor of, of leading the team this year is, um, is pretty, pretty damn special. This is something I've always kind of wanted to do, I've always dreamed of doing. The Ryder Cup has been a huge passion of mine. Uh, I've loved everything that it represents. I've wanted to be on Ryder Cups because I wanted to follow the idols and golfers that I looked up to that inspired me. Hopefully this Ryder Cup will inspire other people. It will bring people that have never played golf to our, to our beautiful game. It will inspire some young Italian kids because it's in Rome to pick up a golf club and potentially be the next Francesco or Eduardo Molinari or Santino Rocca. I'm really happy that I'm able to be in a role where I have that opportunity to do that. I was born in, in 1977. I'm the youngest of four. I have two older brothers and an older sister. Because we were the sort of youngest, we tended to sort of play together. We kind of formed a bond almost at that age onwards. We played some cricket, I played some rugby at school, but I sort of gravitated to golf pretty early. He was eight and I was 14. Dad he was Scottish, so, you know, he's, he was a bit careful with his money, so he wasn't going to buy us four sets of clubs in case we didn't, you know, take to the game. So he bought us like one club each and Luke had this little six iron that he just used to hit and then, you know, we lived like next to a big common, big grass area and we used to just go over there and, you know, we used to try and hit this big oak tree and Luke probably hit in about five shots, you know, it was like 200 yards and he just kept hitting this six iron. Yeah, we would go to a little par three course uh, about 20 minutes from our house and it was very simple, uh, nothing fancy, but uh, certainly my love of the game just kept growing and growing and always would asked my mum to take me to the to the golf course, you know, after school, sometimes before school, and just very passionate about it. We would holiday down in the south of Spain now and again. My dad would take me and my two brothers out, and we would uh, go play these great courses, and I would just, yeah, just love it. I'd love the competition, love seeing that I could hit the ball a little bit further, all those kind of things, and I just love the sport. Even at the age of nine or 10, you could just see, never missed a shot, and it's just kind of like determination. I always remember when he was like playing a video game, he would just keep playing it until he finished it. Whereas I would be like, eh, whatever, you know, I'd go to the next thing. So, you know, he just had that determination. I think in golf you need that. My first real experience of a Ryder Cup probably would have been 1987. I remember Ben Crenshaw broke his putter and had to putt with a wedge against Eamon Darcy. Eamon Darcy managed to hold on and win that match in the singles. I remember the celebration of Jose Maria Lathaval, who was my captain in 2012, doing his little jiggy dance. Those little things as a kid just kind of struck me and, and kind of stayed with me. Um, there was a lot of passion, and I think that was inspiring as a kid to, to be able to watch that. I grew up at a place called Hazelmere. That was my first club that I was a member of for four or five years. Then I went to a different course just down the road called Beaconsfield. Luke joined the club in 1991 as a 14-year-old. 
and uh, quickly made his mark here. He'd been here uh, one year and uh, won the junior championship, 92, 93 and 94. He also managed to then win the club championship in 92 and 94 and it was in fact the first junior to uh, win the club championship. He hit the ball very straight, he struck it beautifully, he always had superb touch, soft hands, tremendous putter. He was a simply outstanding young player. I was around 16 years old when, when I really thought that, man, I think I'd like to really keep pursuing this. My handicap was around scratch or plus one. For that age group, I was pretty solid. I was playing a lot of team golf for England boys. I was in like a national coaching program. It became pretty evident, you know, how, what were the next steps at uh, 16 to, to further this and, and get better and give myself a great chance to, to be a professional. And for me, it seemed like there were some guys that were starting to go to college in the US at that point. So I, I really started to look at that road. I remember meeting Luke for the first time when he was 18 years old and, and took his initial visit to Northwestern was, you know, immediately, you know, struck by what a quiet, thoughtful person he always was. He had a youthful fun to him still at that age, but he had a maturity that was beyond and you could see there was a special unique characteristic to him that didn't exist in most 18 year olds. I was just blown away when I first came over to Northwestern and saw the American football field, you know, and, and the stadium that hold 55,000, and that wasn't even a very big one for college. I mean, most of the football stadiums in the UK, the professional Premier League teams, don't even have 55,000 people. I was just blown away by the golf courses. Yeah, I ended up going to Northwestern. It's like tossing a coin into a, a wishing well. I didn't really know what to expect, but it turned out great really had a good relationship with my coach, Pat Gosh. I was very lucky to stumble across someone that cared so much about the program, that had an understanding of golf, the golf swing, short game. He became my coach for the next 20 years. That's unusual and a big part of a lot of the success I had in golf. I think we really helped him develop the skill set and hopefully inspire the belief that he could win. You know, it, it took time. It didn't happen right away and it took some failure. It took some frustration. I remember him, his Sophomore year after the fall, he referred to himself as a tremendous runner-up because he was having trouble getting over the hump. I know he struggled the first couple of years, couldn't get a win. I think he had seven second places and then he managed to win and then it almost opened the floodgates. He got a significant win right at the end of his fall year against a great player in a great venue against a very good field and that just really sent him off and running. I learned how to win at college. I uh, won 13 times and I had four amazing years. Every aspect of his game developed and that was really when I knew he was going to be something special. I was a great amateur, I was probably the, the, the number one amateur for a couple years in, in the country. Um, with that came some cachet and I was able to get seven starts on the PGA Tour, sponsors invites. You suddenly go from being one of the best amateurs in college to going to being a pretty average player out on the PGA Tour. You have to learn. I thought I was you know, the best putter and best bunker player. And then I go there and I see all these guys that are much better than me. And suddenly you're like, whoa. One of the most nerve wracking experiences of my life, my brother came over, he's caddying for me. I think he always felt safe with me. Because he's a sort of a family man and yeah, I was always there for him. I never kind of took advantage and I try and did the best I could and, and I definitely had his back. 145. You could just see that it was very comforting to him as a person to have Christian there. You know, they had a great relationship. Luke brings a lot of great things out of Christian. Christian brings a lot of great things out of Luke. Christian is such a calming person. You know, Christian doesn't get too excited. He doesn't get too down. He's just, he really has a very calming presence to him. And I think for a 22-year-old trying to play the PGA Tour, that was invaluable. I remember my first check it was one of those first seven events. I finished 18th at the Canadian Open. I think I won $49,000. And, you know, I, I thought I was the richest guy in the world. And 
you know, I went straight out and bought a car for 40,000, which, you know, it, the math doesn't work because you have to pay taxes and stuff. And it was a learning process. Those first few years aren't easy, but uh, I managed to have a pretty successful year until I won my very last event on the PGA Tour, the Southern Farm Bureau Classic, which gave me a two year exemption, which made it a really great year as a rookie. I had Pat always in my ear, just focus on the process, don't focus on the results, don't focus on the money. Get better every day, let's keep hitting at 1%, 1%, let's keep knocking at the door, let's get a little bit better every day. It's for 16 under. Just keep doing what you need to do to have your first top 40, have your first top 20, you know, and, and, and just keep grinding that way and, and the results will kind of take care of themselves. The culmination of another week in which his growing reputation has been greatly enhanced. Then it became, I think I can be a top 10 player in the world. So now it's, you know, I, I can win on the PGA Tour, I can win on the European Tour, I can become a top 10 player in the world. And then you did hit a time where all of a sudden it was, I can maybe be the best player in the world. After Tiger lost his number one status, a lot of players took their crack at it, but nobody could quite, they were jockeying for it, you know. A couple weeks here, four weeks here. Luke Donald's fifth win on the European Tour, his seventh overall, and takes him to number one in the world. To win the money list or the season end rankings on both tours is the kind of year that you'd expect fireworks, but Luke just did it, does it in such a sort of elegant way and quiet way and goes about his business. When Luke got it, he held on to it and he kept it, you know, for 56 weeks in 2011 and 12. I mean, I've got to world number one for just 13 weeks, so I can appreciate how hard it is to stay there. It's a remarkable run of golf and something he should obviously always be incredibly proud of. There was a moment there for me where all of a sudden I thought, I coach the number one player in the world and to watch them go through their whole journey and to absolutely hit the peak of the game. And to reach that pinnacle, but keep pushing to improve, to hold on to it, was really a great accomplishment. The world number one, Luke Donald. I met Luke my freshman year, his senior year. I was studying and going to my classes and taking my tests, and Luke was doing his golf thing. My final senior year, I only had one class left to graduate. It wasn't too taxing. I was an art major in college, so I was spending a lot of time on the golf course. I was spending a lot of time at college bars in the evening. One night, I ran into Diane, started talking a little bit, and kind of hit it off. When I met Luke, he was about to graduate, and I was like, oh, what did you study, you know, what did you major in in school? And he was like, I'm an art major. And I was like, oh, interesting. Um, I was like, what are you gonna, what are you gonna do, like, when you graduate? And he said, I'm gonna try to become a professional golfer. And I was like, oh, like, good, you know, good luck with that. <laughs> it wasn't until the next November that uh, we sort of went on our first official date, and, um, that was 2001. When Luke got his tour card, I literally was like living in my sorority. I didn't really think, you know, that he was gonna be this sort of golf superstar. I, I just, I didn't know anything about golf and, um, and that just wasn't on my radar. 22 years later, it's all going strong and uh, we've been very blessed with uh, a great marriage and uh, three beautiful girls, and we're very lucky. Do you guys have any coins you can bring in your suitcase? Yes. Put in the Trevi Fountain. It's very famous for making wishes come true. Are you going to make a wish? Um, yeah. The, the Europe win the Ryder Cup, what do you think? No. No, oh no. I think we balance each other out, and I think when you're different to your partner, um, it just, you know, it keeps it, like, exciting. I'm looking forward to gelato. Gelato! She's 
definitely a rock for me. Someone that I can talk to about anything. Doesn't tell me what I need to hear or think that I need to hear. She tells me how it is. Quando bevi latte? Tu mangi. You eat. My Italian was not very good. I didn't know, I, I knew a few words, but uh, yeah, I just decided once I got this role that my wife and I would learn a little bit of Italian. You sono Luke. <laughs> Vorrei un caffè con latte. We're obviously going to Italy and to know a few words and to mingle in with the culture and with the, the locals, I think is important. June 21. You're halfway to a perfect week. I feel like I can read a menu in Italian a little better than I could 101 days ago. So, you know, passeggere, like there's some words that, yeah, anyway. Don't just like come now that I'm on all the easy ones. The ones at the beginning were like all the new words, like all on top of each other together. Yeah, these are like review. I Winners don't London make excuses, Diane. I'm very lucky to have her by my side. And we all need people like that in our life. We all need support. She's definitely my best friend. And uh, I'm very, very happy that uh, we got to meet in that uh, shady bar back in Chicago in 2001. Diane doesn't want my trophies all around the house, everywhere. So we kind of try to keep it in one place. And that's kind of over by the office. The Ryder Cups there, you know, sit pride of place behind my desk and everyone has memories of what happened that week. As long as I've known Luke professionally, his biggest goal was to play in the Ryder Cup. That was always it. To represent his country, he was very proud, you know, when he graduated Northwestern that Union Jack was on his back. It's a big part of his identity. So whether it was in the home internationals versus Scotland, Ireland, and Wales, whether it was in the European amateur, all of these different events, he grew up representing England. And obviously the culmination of that is to represent Europe in the Ryder Cup. On the team, representing Europe, Luke Donald. I've been part of six Ryder Cups, uh, four playing and two vice captains. And I've been very fortunate to be on some great teams. I've had great partners. Five of those we've been on winning sides. I've been very fortunate to have a pretty successful individual career, but all my greatest moments and my memories have really come in Ryder Cups. Oh, what a shot, Luke Donald! He's knocked it inside, Tiger. Wow! There was never a time in my career when I started coaching that I imagined this kid from Crystal Lake, Illinois, who stumbled upon becoming the coach in Northwestern would end up inside the ropes being part of the Ryder Cup. You know, that was beyond my wildest imagination for sure. You know, I, I would have never believed you had you said that was possible, but that's been part of my journey with Luke. Um, you know, and I was very fortunate to attend all four Ryder Cups that he played in as a player. It's always been my goal from the very first Ryder Cup I played that at some point, I would have the opportunity to be a captain. So this is something that Luke talked about many, many years ago. And he started carrying his notebook and making notes at Ryder Cups, and especially as vice captain, and throughout the year, writing down things that he wanted to be part of his captaincy someday, had he the ability to do it, and the opportunity and the honor to do it. I had a great experience under Captain Thomas Bjorn in 2018 and enjoyed my time with Padre Harrington in 2021. There's so many decisions that go into everything and you start to realize that as a vice captain and the responsibility of that week and trying to get it right. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to the captain of the 2023 European Ryder Cup team, Luke Donald. I love Luke, loved him forever. He's a high integrity guy that loves the game of golf, that knows, you know, his place in the game. And um, man, his resume speaks for itself. As good as he is inside the ropes, he's a better person outside the ropes. And I'm very happy to be the tandem for 2023. Super looking forward to it. When I heard Luke was going to be captain, I was delighted for him, obviously, as a friend. I feel like it was something that would have been inevitable because of what he's achieved in the game, his impact on the Ryder Cup, and also what he can bring. His insight, intelligence, wealth of knowledge that he's gained across Ryder Cup teams means that he'll be so well equipped in Italy to make sure that all of those players feel a million dollars when they go out there. 
I think he'll be able to inspire them when he speaks, but that's not really what it's gonna be about for Luke. He's gonna inspire them through how prepared he was and the opportunity and the culture he created for them to become the best players they can and for them to shine. He's not a guy who's just gonna be in the team room saying, right guys, get out there, stick it to him. When you're on there on the golf course, get in there, that's not Luke Donald. And I think he will allow those people to be who they are um, to get the most out of their ability. You're straight in here, please, Jess. You know, this captaincy certainly isn't just about me inputting my views or, or the vice captains, but you want to hear from your team uh, too. You want everyone to have good, good communication um, and then be on the, on the same page and, and be energized and be excited. I feel like it's such a great culmination of his career to have watched him come from an 18-year-old guy fresh off a plane from England to becoming a great player and pursuing his art degree and meeting his wife and watching him become the number one player in the world. And all of a sudden you're seeing this grow into now he's this very impressive leader of a next generation of golfers in something that means more to him than anything in the world, the Ryder Cup. The reality is we haven't lost on, on home soil in 30 years. Um, but we're also coming off our worst loss in a Ryder Cup a year and a half ago at Whistling Straits. But the fight is over, and it is a record-breaking victory for the USA. Whistling Straits was a demolition of the European side by the United States. The Americans played really well that week, uh, and some of our bigger players didn't play their best golf. We got beaten pretty badly, the US Again, are going to have a lot of those same guys that beat us, and they're going to be strong. They're going to be very tough. It's my job to try and figure out a way to even the scales a little bit and give us the advantage. We're getting closer and closer, obviously, to September, and with every week and how we see the guys are playing, it's becoming evident that you know, there's gonna be some players that uh, are gonna be on that team. That's the same with every Ryder Cup. Um, and it's about finding those missing pieces. That will be a, a big difference between success and failure is how do those last pieces fit? Who wants it? Who wants to be there? And who wants to be making points for the team? You know, in terms of the captains that I've played under and who I can think about, you know, Luke sort of being somewhat similar to, I would definitely say that's Paul McGinley. And I think he's definitely tried to figure out who can help him, who can give him good bits of information. And then obviously take all the information and make it your own. He's setting the stage to be a really great captain. And obviously the players need to make him look great, but I think he's gonna give the players every opportunity to go out there and feel good about themselves, feel good about the team as a whole and deliver a great performance. I do think Luke's got a really tough job here, but if he does go ahead and, and achieve this against this team that's gonna line up for the United States, in terms of an achievement with the team that we're going to take to it, this could be one of the great ones of all time. I've spent my whole life coaching, you know, and I think this will be the first time I'm going to spectate a coach. To see Luke Donald with his earpiece in, talking to his vice captains, talking to players, leading that group, that's what I'm excited to see. That's what the Ryder Cup in Rome would be about for me. For me, I just hope he gets his moment in the sun the perfect moment of being a winning Ryder Cup captain, but whatever he does, it will be absolutely the best that he could have. We just want everyone to have a great time and feel supported and, you know, I want it to be an amazing week for everybody, for the players, the wives, the caddies, the families, the fans, like everybody. I'm going to try and make sure that I give my team the best opportunity to succeed come Rome uh, in September.